the investigative journal. And before I get to my guest, author of Vatican Assassins, Eric Phelps, let me tie this uh, story into what Eric's going to be talking about. Uh, when Leo Wanton, let me just uh, make a correction. When I said black account, the account that Leo Wanton got the $250 million wasn't the black account. It was the black account that uh, the $250 million ended up with that's never been accounted for that uh, Foster carried over from Switzerland. Now, the interesting part of this story is that Leo Wanta uh, was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to get the money. He always has tried to get over $27 trillion back to the American people, to, even to this day. And he has been unsuccessful due to the fact that at this moment when Foster was sent back to the States, that was July 7th or 8th before he was killed on July 20th, 1993, Wanta was put in a uh, dungeon in Switzerland. And guess who tried to save him? A gentleman by the name of Itzhak Rabin sent a letter and tried to get him out when the uh, authority, when the uh, corrupt people in Switzerland heard Itzhak Rabin was on his way to help Leo Wanta. Leo Wanta was taken in chains and sent to America before Rabin could get there. Now, I'm looking, uh, Itzhak Rabin, of course, then was killed in 1995. Now, I'm looking at a photo on Vatican Assassin's website, and it's a photo of Leah Rabin in 1995 with Pope John Paul II. Now, let me read to you what Eric Phelps says about this photo, and then we're going to get to Eric about some really interesting things that have come up since we last talked to him. Uh, he says this, this photo taken from November 13th, 2000 edition of the Pittsburgh's Tribune Review depicts the late Leah Rabin in 1995 following her private audience at the Vatican with the greatest accomplice to her husband's, that's Itzhak Rabin, who was trying to help Mr. Wanta, cold-blooded murder, the infallible Pope John Paul II, the Mossad and the arm of the Jesuit General's international intelligence community carried out the assassination as the disobedient Freemason and Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin opposed Rome's policy for Zionist Israel. For the Jesuits will never allow any portion of the old city of Jerusalem to be given to the Muslims, especially the Palestinians controlled by the order through Arafat. Indeed, and Eric says this, the arm of the church is long. Eric Phelps, how are you today? It's pleased to be with you, Greg. Thank you for having me. And that is quite a quote, quite a picture, and quite uh, the church's arm is very long. Tell us again, just to refresh our listeners' memory uh, memories, you've been with us before, and tell us why you feel if we want to stop the New World Order, one good step is to remove the Jesuits from American soil. Absolutely right. Uh, they've been suppressed and expelled at least 80 times in their past, from since their inception in 1540 to the present. Um, the most powerful nations of Europe have expelled them, especially the Roman Catholic nations of France, Portugal, and Spain in the 1700s. And uh, and uh, Britain had expelled them many times. France has expelled them. I've counted no less than eight times. Uh, Germany expelled them in 1872, so Russia expelled them in 1820 until they were formally readmitted by Lenin in 1922. So <clears throat> the Jesuits have been expelled as a matter of state policy, not as a matter of their religion, and that they're always dabbling in politics seeking to control the state. And the ultimate expulsion was uh, Pope Clement XIV's papal bull of suppression and extinction uh, Dominic Agredemptor Noster that he signed in 1773, uh, which officially did away with the Jesuit order. Now, can you tell us how, and uh, just uh, in a quick recap before we get into some other interesting points, just how the Jesuits have infiltrated and have uh, a working relationship with people like the Knights of Malta, the Shriners, the Freemasons, Knights of Columbus, and other groups? How does this uh, work? after your research, uh, after you've done extensive research into this? Okay, um, with regard to the Knights of Malta, the Jesuits control the Pope, the Black Pope controls the White Pope, uh, with the Black Pope being, being Peter Hans Kohlenbach, the White Pope being uh, Pope Benedict XVI. The Pope then controls the Knights of Malta in that the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta is a cardinal, and he was conferred that status by Leo XIII around 1878. Uh, the Jesuits control, again, the papacy, uh, and thus they control the Knights of Columbus through the papacy. 
the Jesuits wrote all the high rites of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. They wrote the first 25 rites in the College of Clermont in Paris, France in 1754, according to my Masonic book, Ask Me Another Brother, a Masonic quiz book. And so they wrote the first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite, then they wrote the last eight degrees when they were protected by Frederick the Great, uh, when they were expelled and suppressed by the Pope. So they created the Council of the 33rd Degree and thus control all high-level Freemasonry. In fact, Leo XIII's uh, Secretary of State, uh, Cardinal Rampala, was a member of the high-level Masonic OTO, Order of Oriental Templars, the same as was Aleister Crowley. So the Jesuits control Freemasonry uh, not through the papacy, but directly through the black pope himself via the Illuminati and other secret societies, and then they control the Roman Catholic brotherhoods through the pope and thus his hierarchy. How would you say they went about? Uh, one of the things that I've, I've read uh, that you've uh, researched is that one of their main goals was to infiltrate the Catholic Church. They knew they had to do this in order to um, reach their goal with uh, their other uh, minions, and that means the goal of the New World Order, to take over the world. Tell us how, uh, I guess, they uh, began this. Uh, when did this begin, and how is it? what is the present situation in the, in the Vatican? Okay, the, the Jesuit Order is the spearhead or the backbone behind the Counter-Reformation. And therefore, the purpose of the order was to thwart the Reformation, bring it to naught, and then after that, uh, bringing a pope of their power, a pope of their control, to ruling the world through uh, and set the third Hebrew temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. That's always been their plan. And so they have had success in the past, but then suppressed in the past. And really, to know their power, now we have to go back to their uh, formal reinstitution by Pius VII in 1814, when they were revived and and created fresh, or be re actually brought back into power, but nothing had ever changed. And so from 1815 to the present, that's probably the most important period of history for us to review and know about. Okay, and now bring it up to today's uh, situation so okay. people can understand how it works there. And I just want to add something. Uh, when I was there, well, I used to work in Rome, and I worked as a, a freelance reporter, uh, and I was talking to people back about 20 years ago regarding the same subject, and the same subject came up there, and the Italian people and some people that were researching it were very clear that there was some group headed by the black pope controlling the Vatican, uh, and that was 20 years ago. So tell us a little bit about the situation uh, that exists in, in modern-day uh, Rome. Well, without a doubt, the, the black pope rules the Vatican. He rules uh, the pope, he rules the hierarchy, he, he rules the curia. Uh, his headquarters is Borgo Santo Spirito number 5, outside of Vatican walls, and thus he... He, although he controls different factions, because within the papacy you don't have a total unity of orders and individuals, so he controls the factions, or he he he, uh, he brings about the success of certain factions while thwarting others. But ultimately, at the very pinnacle of power stands the Jesuits and his assistants, and they in turn control the papacy. Uh, and in fact, when I spoke at um, in Nevada several years ago, there was a a Roman Catholic woman there, and she said to me, I want to know why you're still alive. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I just believe the Lord is sovereign. He'll take care of me, and when he's finished with me, then he will allow the, the Jesuits to kill me, as long as I keep personal sin out of my life and I seek to be obedient to him. And she says, I want you to know that in the Catholic Church I went to for years, that when the Jesuits ever came, our priests were all scared to death and had the nervous sweats. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a question. I mean, you make no bones about it. You've done the research, and I know you're not talking just uh, uh, from the top of your head here. You've researched this issue, and I know your heart is in the right place to get at the bottom of this evil that's taken over in our government. We can see it. And in the stories I just mentioned at the outset of the show, the killing of Itzhak Rabin, uh, the, ma the jailing of Leo Wanta, a, a very loyal U.S. Treasury agent who was trying to do the right thing. Vince sure. Foster, all these murders. Sure, are... Kenneth Starr is CFR. He's a dirty, stinking rat. 
Okay, and what mm-hmm. is, <laughs> you don't make any bones about no. it. No, and we shouldn't. We should call a spade a spade. Kenneth Starr was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a good buddy of Clinton, Dick Cheney, all those other criminals on the member on the Council on Foreign Relations. Which group should be abolished? In fact, it should be tried for high treason and every one of them executed. Yeah. Just like the Royal Institute for International Affairs in England. The papacy runs England through the RIIA, just as it does here through the CFR. Trilateral Commission. Now, when you uh, were talking to that uh, that uh, Catholic lady, uh, the question now arises: How do you differentiate? And I know uh, I just want you to explain this to our listeners. When people think of the Jesuits, they think of a Catholic order. They are anything but. That's correct. Uh, that can you explain that and how we can differentiate between that? And how far deep does this go into the Jesuit order? I'm sure there's some priests in the Jesuit order that uh, have no idea what's going on at the top Correct. level. Correct. But explain there, this and how this division is made. Okay, to begin with, the Jesuit order is not subject to to the Pope or any member of the Roman hierarchy, bishop, archbishop, or cardinal. Okay, I cut you short there. I okay. didn't look at the clock, but we'll get back continue right after this break on the investigative journal here on the radio right here on the air basically what i'm doing with eric phelps is uh he's taking off the uh the black cloth of the jesuits right now he's exposing them for what he thinks they really are eric go ahead so people can understand what this order really is all about okay um their their secret worship is luciferianism or satanism in fact, I just discovered a, a piece out of uh, Rene Philip Muller's great work, The Secret and Power of the Jesuits, where the Jansen is portrayed the Jesuits as worshiping Baphomet and Satan, and they have an owl at the top of the picture. And it's the very owl that's used at the Bohemian Grove with the Jesuits established in Northern California many years ago. So they're Satanists, they're Luciferians, they're the Office of Skull and Bones. Uh, the Jesuits are the ultimate skull and bones men, and the, and the initiation of skull and bones it involves Madame de Pompadour, who they desecrate because she was the one who motivated Louis the Fifteenth to expel the Jesuits from France in 1767. So the Jesuits are Luciferians, and they want to establish a one-world government out of Jerusalem, out of the Third Hebrew Temple, where it will be the worship of Satan, and thus they're merely using the papacy as a means to this end. As, as they are involved also uh, with their temporal, uh, as you call them, coagitators yes. uh, in our government and governments around the world. Yes. Is that the way you view it from your research? Absolutely. The temporal coagitators of America, the trusted third party that Ignatius Loyola speaks of in his secret instructions, is the Council on Foreign Relations that was established in 1921 with House and a few others. Uh, in England, it's the Royal Institute for International Affairs. It was founded in 1919. And they have controlled England, I say, and since George III. So the Jesuits always have a trusted third party whereby they control a government. Before their suppression, they always were the confessors or advisors to the king and queens and, and monarchs. How did now they, they, um, you know, if I may interrupt, it just sure. came to me. How did, they, uh, how did they get this type of obedience? And that's the secret of the of uh, Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. Uh, and the spiritual exercises, what they essentially do is divest themselves of every vestige of their own private free wills and completely and totally prostrate their free wills to their superior, telling all of their lives, all of their secret vices, all of their failures and successes so that with, a, with a, a look at their record, the Jesuit general or the superior of the novice, or whoever it might be, knows implicitly the life of this man. And so they, they have learned this absolute obedience, as Ignatius Loyola called it, uh, to be obedient like the stick in the hand of an old man through the spiritual exercises. And as we move on, uh, I just wanted to, uh, right before we have a couple minutes before the break, how, how deep does this go? Because I know my first, uh, uh, when I first learned of the Jesuits, I was a high school student uh, going to Notre Dame High School uh, with under the Holy Cross Fathers uh, from Notre Dame, and across the across town was the was Loyola High School uh, with the Jesuits. 
Uh, now, how deep does this go? I mean, uh, only the higher level Jesuits in Rome. Uh, how do they? How do they operate? Well, the remember that the Jesuit order is a military order, as Napoleon told us in his uh, memoirs, and so they have a chain of command. The general, the superior general. Uh, is in command of the lower generals, and of course the superior general has his assistants. Each assistant is in charge of an assistancy, and there are t presently ten assistancies in the world. And so these assistants then, underneath them, have what's called provincials. And the provincials are subject then to the assistant. In the United States, there are ten provincials who then answer to the assistant in Rome. And the Jesuits have broken the world down into, I believe at this moment, 85 different regions, uh, 85 provinces. There's 10 regions and 85 provinces. And therefore, uh, these 85 pro provincials are subject to their assistance, and they file their monthly reports, and maybe even more often than that now, so that the assistants in Rome know absolutely and completely every political, financial, religious, social movement in that country so they can coordinate together what they intend to do. So it's absolute obedience. It's a military organization. It's a soldiership. The Jesuit general is a general of a foreign power. He's regarded as a sovereign of all sovereigns, and thus that's how it works. And uh, after the break, I want to get into your take on this immigration issue because we know the Catholic Church has supported this illegal immigration of our in our country, and I want to get your take on that. Uh, so let's uh, take a break right now. We'll be back in three minutes. According to my guest Eric Phelps, uh, the Jesuits are a big part in why this country is uh, breaking up at the seams. If you want to read more about what uh, Eric has researched over the years, uh, this is an incredible research work that he's done trying to get at the bottom of what's going on in our country, including uh, things like the murder of John F. Kennedy, the relationships of many people in the Council on Foreign Relations, Prescott Bush, George H. Bush, all people who Eric Phelps describes as tempor temporal coagitators of this feared Jesuit order. Go to www.vaticanassassins.org, and you can read all about that. And he has a new uh, book coming out called Vatican, Vatican Assassins, uh, third edition, and that has some new information, and some of it we've uh, done on this show in the last uh, few months. And, Eric, I, I did want to get your take on this, uh, the, the Catholic Church coming out in favor of the uh, immigration issue, which seems to be causing strife between... Uh, uh, you know, the American people and the illegal immigrants. Go ahead. Right. Uh, first of all, I I try to use the, another term for those people coming in. I call it an alien invasion. Okay. And that the term immigrant implies some legality. Okay. But, but what they're doing is, is it goes back to even farther than NAFTA and GATT, which the Knights of Malta were very much in favor, especially the Coca when he came to Clinton and encouraged him to sign that. And of course, Lee Iacocca was a knight of Malta and was involved in the Kennedy assassination. But with NAFTA and GATT, that has aided to the destruction of Mexican industries. And so the Jesuits, remembering that they hated Mexico, that they hated Benito Juarez, they hated Calais, because Calais had expelled the Jesuits in the 1920s and did everything he could to release his country from the death grip of the Jesuits. So it seems to be payback time for the Mexicans now. And so they, their industries, their infrastructure has been ruined. The Jesuits' Rockefeller Empire has confiscated their oil, taken their natural resources, and thus these uh, Mexican people, Mexican Roman Catholic people, are now being encouraged with this Aslan movement for the retaking of the Southwest. And so they're coming in by the millions, encouraged by that high-level Freemason, Vincente Fox, who is a former head of Coca-Cola down in there in, uh, in Mexico, in, a, in conjunction with his uh, brother Mason, George Bush. And so they're working together to promote this invasion. Now, the question is why? Well, it's the Aslan movement openly, but I also believe that this is going to justify the roundup of these aliens and putting them in concentration camps. And we have some, what, four or 600 concentration camps already in place, and so this will be a justification to begin to use them as arresting these illegal 
uh, aliens coming in the country. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the major purposes. The other purpose is, is, to, and is to unite the white Roman Catholic peoples with the white historic Protestant peoples together. It serves an ecumenical purpose to drive them all into a right-wing fascist position that is espoused by Fox News Network and those Jesuits to control that operation. Okay. Go ahead. Is there anything else you want to add, or does that pretty well cover it? So that pretty well covers it. That's, I believe that's their purpose. And the Roman hierarchy is totally behind it. McCarrick of Washington, D.C., Roger Mahoney, Los Angeles, they're all behind it because this is exactly what they want. The overthrow of the U.S. Constitution, the declaration of martial law, the opening of the camps, and the resident illegal uh, aliens in this country will justify that move. Uh, let's move on then to uh, something else. I wanted to get back to uh, the way you view, you know, you've described the Jesuit order uh gaining this obedience from all their uh, temporal coagitators, as you call them, as the ultimate chameleons. Uh, and what you mean by that is they can uh, put, on any, uh, uh, put on any government face, can put on any cloth from any religion, blend in, and basically destroy it from within. Absolutely. In and, fact, uh, I just found a quote in a book uh, written in 1916. It's a little paragraph. May I read that to you? Sure. Okay, uh, quote, this is from Watchman. He's an anonymous English Calvinist and patriot. He wrote a book called Roman Germany, the Plot for the Downfall of Britain, written in 1916. Quote, the object of Rome is to subjugate and subdue, to conquer and rule the British race and empire. The Vatican is working as it ever has worked and ever will for the humiliation of England. By working upon the vanity, ambition, greed, and selfishness of certain individuals in whom infidelity or false religion has extinguished every patriotic and generous impulse, the Jesuits are able to obtain a number of adherents devoted to their cause, ready to become traitors to their own country and to sacrifice its interests, prosperity, and power to the ambition of Rome. By means of these secret agents, occupying positions of more or less importance in every order and rank of society and in every office in the state, the Jesuits are able by combined action to powerfully influence public opinion and even direct the policy of the country. For these agents are to be found not only in the churches and religious bodies, but in the schools, in the army and the navy, in the working men's clubs, which are the unions, in the press, in parliament, and perhaps even in the cabinet. Our most deadly enemies are those who exist secretly in our midst. Unquote. And that's yeah, and what they've that's, done here. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, if we just talked about, let's, uh, you know, just put aside the word Jesuit right now, and we started saying, you know, George, how many people are calling George W. Bush a traitor? How many people are calling people in our government treasonous? How many people cannot believe the laws they're passing, uh, which do not reflect the views of Americans? This has to come from somewhere. I mean, and again, when you use the word chameleon, and then you put in the Jesuit factor here, add in Georgetown and all the other things you said they control, give us a real flavor of their power in this country right now, if you could, in the next ten minutes. Uh, okay. Well, they control all the politics. They control every state capital from here in Harrisburg and Pennsylvania to Sacramento and California with Arnold Schwarzenegger through that Roman Catholic high-level papal knight, subject to the provincial Thomas Schmaltz, who is also a good friend of what Warren Buffett. They control Washington, D.C., and have controlled Washington, D.C., since no later than the assassination of Lincoln, because it was Jesuit Bernard of Wigan that did it, and orchestrated it all through John Seward and others. The Jesuits control the Federal Reserve Bank. It's run by the Knights of Malta, controlling the Class A stockholders, Chase Manhattan Bank, Morgan Guarantee, in fact, Morgan in New York is a direct telex to the Vatican. Uh, they control all your, your notorious religions, all your historic Protestant churches via Freemasonry. They're all apostate. They're all the National Council, all the World Council of Churches, and they control all your, all your Romanism, all your Roman Catholicism, regardless of the orders, because those orders must be submitted to them. They control all your higher institutions of learning, your, all your major universities, because they have a party line there that you cannot deviate from. If you're a professor, you will be expelled if you're not a socialist. So they're the masters behind your education, economics, politics, religion. And when you have that, you have just about every vehicle. The American Medical Association, the American Bar Association, all controlled by the Jesuit order. 
<laughs> incredible, incredible. And I know what do they do? Uh, basically, we we all talk a lot about all these murder for hires in our government. I mean, this goes on and on and on. Uh, I just received an email. Uh, recently, since the 80s, over 100 scientists and biologists killed, and there's some really uh, interesting uh, correlations between what their research in, in, in uh, biological warfare and their deaths in to strange circumstances. So yeah, what do the Jesuits basically, they basically kill uh, people who do not agree with them or find out or try to go against them? Okay, the Black Pope, the Jesuit general, controls the international banking community. With that international banking community, he also controls the international drug trade. With the international drug trade and banking community, he controls all the intelligence agencies. They all work together at the top, from the KGB or the SBR to the CIA to the Mossad to the Pakistani ISI, German BND, British SIS, MI5, MI6. They all work together at the top because at the top are Knights of Malta who run it. And so then they have, in addition to that, they control all of organized crime. They control the Sicilian Mafia. They control the Russian Mafia. They control the Japanese Yakuza. They control all the Mafia and this all organized crime. And therefore, they have a host of assassins that they can choose to use if they decide on a piece of business to eliminate somebody who is truly giving them a problem. And virtually a crime that's, uh, if you control the investigation, just as we see in every one of these murder for hires, if you control the investigation, you basically can get away with murder. That's correct. Just like David Ferry said in the movie JFK, they're untouchable. And the to... only one who can touch them is God. And therefore, that's who we need to seek his help and meet him on his terms. And then once we would do that, then hopefully the Lord would put in the heart of one of these popes to suppress the Jesuit order as he did in 1773. And when the Jesuit order is formally suppressed and extinguished, it has no legal authority to function. Mm -hmm. Now, it may well foment a huge war like it did the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, but at least it's formally suppressed. And in this country, they're deeply embedded in what, Georgetown University and other, how many universities they own in this country? I know you Okay, have they guys. have 28 major universities in this country. 50% of all your Roman Catholic institutions of higher learning are in the United States. The United States is their major springboard of attack in reducing the world and all the governments of the world to submit to the temporal power of the Pope. So if the Jesuits were expelled from the United States, that would be a great blow for liberty and freedom, not only here but in the world. And I know when you say things like that, uh, how and that, I'm thinking about what that lady said to you uh, back in uh, when you were giving that speech in Nevada, I think it was. How have you stayed safe? I know you're you're basically uh, when, if anyone uh, comes you know, tries, you know, for example, I know that Jesuits or some people try to criticize you heavily, they try to attack you in certain ways, and you are very steadfast in your, uh, in your research and your work, and you do not allow them, uh, basically, to get the best of you. I guess that's the best way to put it. How do you confront uh, someone uh, that is basically trying to undermine what you're doing? Well, what I do is I, I try never to have an ad hominem attack until I'm forced to, until they force me to it. What I do is I put forward all the information that I have, some key quotes from some very key people in history, and, and ask them to reconsider their position. And if they don't want to reconsider their position in light of the past suppressions and their present power, then I am forced to debate with them if they will debate with me. If they will not debate me or have me on their show, then I'm calling them openly Jesuit temporal coadjutors. And if they want me to withdraw the charge, then they can either host somebody to deal with the Jesuit order or begin to attack them themselves in showing the works that they've done. And I think your motives here are there's no anti-Catholic motives. You've said that uh, a number of times on, on this show. And your motives are pure in a sense where you want to see our country uh, restored. That's correct. If I was anti-Catholic, I would have never written a book to defend President Kennedy and his Jesuit assassination carried out by many high-level prostitute Protestant Freemasons like J. Edgar Hoover and others. So yes, I'm not anti-Roman Catholic people. I am anti-Pope, 
anti his doctrines of infallibility and temporal power, anti-Roman hierarchy, anti-Jesuit general, and his Jesuit order that seeks to rule the world and deprive what God has established in that national sovereignty for nations is key to uh, nations living peacefully with one another. You know what I uh, oh, I think would be interesting here again to do this? Uh, you have tied, uh, you've, you've said something through your research which was uh, very interesting to think about, and that is how they control both sides of most every war yes. that you can think back of. Yes. Let's start in uh, the World War II and bring it up in the next few minutes here, and then we have a break in a few minutes after that. Bring up how they uh, did that uh, controlled World War II, both sides of the war, and then how they're doing it now in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, with regard to the Allied powers, the Jesuits controlled Winston Churchill. Uh, they controlled um, uh, Joseph Stalin. They controlled FDR. And uh, those are the major Allied powers that controlled those three. And with regard to the Axis, they controlled Hirohito. I just finished a piece in my third edition on Hirohito. They controlled uh, Adolf Hitler. They controlled Benito Mussolini. And, of course, they controlled all of Hitler's puppets throughout the uh, Eastern Europe. So they controlled both factions. And then, here's the, here's the, I hate to use the word beauty, here's the intrigue of it all. Then they coordinate these factions together to accomplish what they want to accomplish. For example, when, when Hitler's generals uh, had, uh, had, had just were ready to destroy the British, Dunkirk, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, Hitler issues the order to stop. And this stop order allows the British to escape. Now, of course, you and your listeners know that when you're in war, you want to kill and annihilate the enemy, because as soon as you do that, the war is over. Well, this was not done. In the invasion of Normandy on D-Day, when that happened, General Patton said that the war would be over in 10 days, because they shortly thereafter had the Germans surrounded in the Falaise pocket in France. And Patton went to Eisenhower to request permission to close the Falais pocket. The story is in a book called Battle of the Generals. And Eisenhower would not allow him to close that pocket. Therefore, 250,000 German soldiers escaped. And Little Hart writes in his book on, uh, with regard to the war, he didn't know why the Americans allowed that to happen because that secured the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. Well, why would they want to extend the war into 1945? Because the majority of your Jews were killed in the concentration camps from June of 1944 till April of 1945. They had more Jews to kill in the East. Um, so there are things like this that happened. In the Battle of Anzio, we see the same thing. Uh, there were Jews. They had to get the Jews out of Rome to take them to Auschwitz. So therefore, uh, Anzio had to be fought, and Patton was relieved of his command in Sicily. Otherwise, if he was in charge of U.S. forces, he would have went straight to Rome, and they would have not have killed all the Jews, sent them to Auschwitz with General S.S. General Wolf there. So they coordinate both sides together majestically, and that's exactly what they're going to do now with the Muslim leaders, and the Anglo-American leaders. Well, I might and add, if, just to make it clear, and you're saying through your research that they're able to, and what you've said before, they're able to infiltrate these groups and get these higher powers all playing the same card game, all working with them, correct? Basically correct. selling out their country and their religions. That's correct. Okay. Listen, we're going to take a break, uh, maybe take a call, finish up. I want to get your take on uh, the Middle East and the Jesuit influence. We'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal with Eric Phelps. And one thing, Eric, can you stay about 15 minutes after the hour? If you'd like me to. Okay, yeah. Maybe we'll, yeah, we'll hold you about 15 minutes longer than we planned. But let me get back uh, to this. Uh, I wanted to get to your take now on the Middle East, how they're setting us up for what many consider to be the uh, World War III. Well, I believe that what the Jesuits are doing is what they did in World War II when they used Germany. I believe the same uh, program they had, they implemented for Germany, they're going to do here. Therefore, as the German army was used to invade Russia, and its purpose was to annihilate the Orthodox population, but never to overthrow Joseph Stalin, which Hitler made sure that did not happen. Even so, it is now. The purpose of the American military 
to be in uh, the Middle East, there, in these Muslim nations, I believe, is that it is a war of annihilation against the Muslim peoples. And uh, this is going to continue along with the destruction of the mosques because the Jesuits used the Germans to destroy many, many Orthodox churches in Russia. So as they're destroying the mosques and the Muslim people, they are also, I believe, going to destroy Mecca and Medina and blame that on the American military because the Bin Laden Construction Company they are the only ones who can get near those mosques. And therefore, since Bin Laden is a member of Carlisle Group with the Bushes, it only makes sense that they would be given certain mini-nukes or some type of pulse weapon to put in those, those mosques and ultimately take them out about the time some American bombers or fighters are, fly, fighters are flying overhead. So they're going to blame the destruction of the Mecca and Medina mosques as well as the mosques in Jerusalem on the U.S. And when that happens, then they will declare a complete and total holy war against us that will never end as long as there's a Muslim on the face of this earth. And uh, that will ultimately result, I believe, in the deliberate sacrifice of our military by our military high command, controlled by the Jesuits through Georgetown and the CFR. And then once our military sacrifice, we will be invaded as Germany was invaded and our country will be partitioned, and that will be the end of what was once historically white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Western civilization. And the lineup is now, if you look at what's going on in the news, Russia, China have aligned with the Middle East, mm -hmm. with uh, which means that uh, uh, they would be uh, very angry at us for going over there, giving them a reason to uh, invade our borders, correct? Correct. I call it in my book, The Sino-Soviet Muslim Invasion. But there's also the possibility, I've been entertaining recently with some people to see what you think. Remember that Hitler and Stalin divided Poland, mm -hmm. and then later Hitler attacked Poland, and later their enemies, Stalin and Hitler, are supposedly openly enemies, which of course they weren't. They worked through the whole duration of the war together. But that could very well happen with the Muslim world, that the U.S. for a while be allied with Russia, because Putin's a knight of Malta. Mm -hmm. And so they could, the Jesuits could decide on an alliance, a temporary alliance between Russia and the U.S. to do lots of killing in the Middle East, but then ultimately Russia turned against us and they'd be an invader too. Okay, listen, uh, stay with us after this break. I want to take a couple calls, and we'll be back with Eric Phelps, author of Vatican Assassins. The ultimate deception being played right before our very eyes, and we're listening to Eric Phelps' research into how the... Uh, America's gotten into the position it's in now. I mean, we're really, we see on a daily basis our liberties taken away. We see the dollar uh, devalued. We see everything happening. Our government uh, basically run on with a bunch of liars and thieves who are showing themselves daily, if you look closely at exactly what they're doing. Eric Phelps' uh, uh, research has now uncovered uh, some startling things to many people for People who've researched this before, it's not so startling, but all goes back to the Vatican, the Black Pope, the Jesuit Order, and its minions throughout the world who are bringing up about another major war. Let me take a call. Uh, Carson in Canada, you're on the Investigative Journal. Hi, Greg. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I enjoy your show. Well, thank you, and we've kept Eric here, so uh, hopefully you have a question. Yes, I have a quick question for Eric. Um, the Jesuits must have a lobby in uh, Washington, D.C. Who represents the Jesuits? Um, the Jesuits are, well, they have what's called a, a, a Jesuit conference, where they, uh, they make known their wishes through that. For example, they've utterly condemned gun ownership and a few other things. But um, they, could, they really use the Roman hierarchy to put forth what they want in Washington. Well, uh, unlike the Zionist lobby, who, who are very front and center and, and very in the face with, with, with all their uh, political uh, affiliations, and uh, they're, they're really obvious. And so um, are, are, are you saying the, the, the Jesuits don't have an obvious lobby? I'm saying that they do have, it's called a Jesuit conference, which they do lobby there, and there are Jesuits daily in Washington, but with regard to the Zionists, the Jesuits rule the Zionists. They've controlled the Zionists since their inception back in the late 1800s, and they run the government of Israel. Yes, 
Um, you mentioned um, the Jesuits during World War II in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't remember uh, any of the history I read where the Jesuits had a, had a separate flag flying in World War II Germany where the Zionists did. Well, the Jesuits controlled Hitler and Himmler. Himmler designed the SS after the Jesuit order. Himmler was a very powerful individual in Bavaria, and he was put in that office by Michael Cardinal von Fahlhofer, who was the Archbishop of Munich, and thus he was um, probably 200 yards away from the Jesuit College or Jesuit Church of St. Michael's there in Munich. So the whole Third Reich was birthed out of Bavaria, and the Jesuits ruled Bavaria. So well, the Jesuits are not seeking uh, a country of their own like the Zionists have done, and have uh, wreaked a lot of havoc on the world, the Zionists well, have. If Carson, uh, if I could just say, Carson, after? this is Greg Szymanski. Carson, are you there? Hi. Oh, hi. I just want to add something here, just from my point of view, uh, from some of the research I've done. Uh, there's a point in this discussion here where we have to understand that the Jesuits uh, do not openly, uh, what you're talking about is a group who, work under the table, so to speak. They don't let their intentions be known, according to uh, Eric Phelps and other researchers. They basically are the ultimate chameleons. So they're not going to fly a flag. They're not going to tell you who they are. They may be a Catholic, but yet be a Satanist. They may be say they're a Jew and they're a Satanist. Basically, what they do is they hide behind the cloth. And we'll get back. i got to take a break. You stay on there, Carson. And, and uh, Eric, you come back. we got a whole bunch of callers I want to get to. We'll extend this a little longer. Uh, we'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Nick and Assassins, uh, he's going to stick with us. we got a whole bunch of callers uh, I want to get to. Carson, i sorry I interrupted you there. I okay. wanted to get your point across, so go right ahead. Okay. I, Eric, I'd like to come at this, uh, what I'm trying to say, at a little different angle, if I may. Like, uh, I'm thinking of Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry, mm -hmm. who is Jewish. Uh, He's skull and bones. Pardon? He's skull and bones. Uh, yeah, well, his parents are Jewish, and his wife is Jewish, and his younger brother he, he is married Jewish, to a Jewish right? woman. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I, I really, really think the influence of Israel on the, on the North American continent, including Canada, is way out of proportion to what it should be. So, you know, I, I just want to say this. Um, do you feel there's a conspiracy by the Israeli, the Jewish people, to overdo their influence in our way of life? I believe that the Jews that we see are the Pope's Masonic Jewish Zionists. They're loaded all throughout the CFR and also in Canada. But the average Jewish people, they're not... Uh, how to overthrow a way of life. Uh, we have to look at their leaders, like Bronfman and others. They're the ones that are controlled by the papacy, and thus they are controlled by the Jesuits. Yes. I, 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 can you offer any, any place to, where one could research this, that the Jesuits has such influence in our life? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, there's a couple books apart from mine. You can get Edmund Paris's great works, uh, The Vatican Against Europe. You can get his uh, Secret History of the Jesuits. Uh, Greisinger wrote a tremendous two-volume set called The Jesuits, uh, The History of the Orders Told to the German People. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a group called the Bank of Wisdom, if you get on the Internet, and even though it's an atheistic group, they put a CD together well, composing all these tremendous books on the Jesuits on CD called bankofwisdom.com, I believe. And there, if you get their CD, you can get a pretty good history of the order, apart from my book, if you ever wanted to. Get that when it comes out. And uh, Carson, I'm mad, Ed. You can go to www.vaticanassassins.org and get some information there. Thanks a lot, uh, Carson. i got to move on. Carl in Oklahoma, you're on the investigative journal. Yes, Greg. Thank you for taking my call. Okay, go ahead. Uh, nice Eric, to have you. Eric, uh, uh, as to the black popes, uh, they are listed in the several prophecies. I'm sure you're aware of the prophecies. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, well, one of the major black popes that they just put in is Negroponte. If you do a, a, a <laughs> well, word no search his name, it's yeah, uh, yeah, Negra, it's, meaning the Negro or the black, and Ponte yeah. means the pontificate or the pomp, uh, pope. Yeah, John Negroponte is a very evil, wicked individual. I believe he's booking the snake. He's a member of the CFR and most assuredly serves the Jesuit order. Yes. Uh, 
I left my number with the uh, with the uh, producer, and if you can please uh, give me a call after the show, I have some critical information for you uh, that that I wish you could consider. I would love to talk uh, with you. Also, if you can uh, uh, do a uh, computer search on John's uh, website there, RBN website, and look at Eric uh, Williams website and uh, go to his website, you'll see a, uh, a list of a uh, conference call that we do on Thursday nights. Eric Williams. Okay. Yes. He, he has a show at 11 a.m. till noon on RBN. RBN, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day, and I thank you both for do what you're doing for the world. Okay, because thank we you. are thank at the end time. Thank you, Carl. I'm going to move right on. John in California. John, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. You're on the Investigative Journal. Yeah, and uh, your guest name is uh, Eric? Eric Phelps, yes. Eric, uh, are you online? Uh, yes, I am, John. What's your website? It is www.vaticanassassins.org. Vaticanassassins.org? Dot .org. Dot org. Dot .com yeah, is theirs. Dot .org is mine. Okay, I got <laughs> part of that. I, I didn't know what the if it was dot .org or dot .com or whatever. Yeah, but, dot .org. Okay. I just wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, have you ever uh, read uh, John, Dr. John Coleman's works? Uh, he wrote a book called The Committee of 300. Yes, very good uh, book. I believe he, uh, you're right on point with a lot of the uh, things you're talking about, but uh, I you wanted know, to he... ask you uh, how you felt about the his, you take a pyramid, uh, the Jesuits were really, uh, weren't they Weren't they just a, pretty much a strong arm of the New World Order? Well, there, so there, when he he mentions names, that's a really a good uh, source. If anybody wanted to read that, uh, that when I read it, I liked it very well. In I, fact, he brought out a fact I hadn't known, and that was that Joseph Redinger, who was a high-level Freemason and a Jesuit, was the founder of the Bilderbergers. So John Coleman has put out some very good information. I believe the Committee of Three Hundred, though, is at the top Masonic, not of Malta, and they're controlled ultimately by the Vatican through the Black Pope. Right now, you do you think that the the Vatican pretty much controls uh, the industrialists, the bankers, the uh, the uh, powers that be? As far absolutely, as that absolutely, absolutely. And the most okay. w w wicked, the wealthiest men in the world are Gentiles, not okay, Jews. Now the way he explains it in the book, he feels like that the most of the royal families uh, in Europe and uh, are at the top of the at the top of the pyramid, not the not the Vatican. No, no. I see. I would I would defer with him on that on the basis of Revelation seventeen eighteen that the woman which thou sawest is a great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth which is indeed Rome, but Rome controls all the black nobility, all the right. nobles. Well, that makes through, sense through their secret societies. That's right. Because he didn't use a he didn't use a whole lot of uh, of scripture reference mm -hmm. to uh, especially in Revelations to the order that he showed in in his book. It was mostly uh, his own experience. I, I guess he was he was in counterintelligence with the British, British and the, intelligence, and I believe. Yes, Israel and mm -hmm. Greg. I, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Go right ahead. I just wonder if you ever heard. I, you know, he he kind of disappeared about, or maybe even you, Eric. Uh, <laughs> if you if you if if he's still alive. I, just I don't right know. Out. You know, right. he was I, supposed I, to I be. I haven't heard from him or used I to be. I don't know what uh, happened to John. The first he time I ever he... heard him was. I believe on John Stapmiller's program a long, long time ago, probably six six years ago. Well, I don't know either. I'll ask John though. Maybe he knows where, where he's at. Right. Okay. And Anything I, well, else? Thank you. Thank you very much for for both of you guys doing what you're doing. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I want to get to Charles in Texas. Uh, Charles, you're on the Investigative Journal. Uh, hello, man. Uh, Mr. Phelps, how is your your book going to be available? It's going to be strictly through the internet. Uh, no, there'll be some people selling it. My old publisher will be offering it first in CD, and hopefully a gentleman has offered to find me some money for the first printing, but it'll be first on CD. Yeah. Is it still going to be in May? Well, I'm, I'm shooting for little... June 1st. June 1st? <laughs> yeah. Also, do you, I know you talk about uh, Masonic and Jesuit involvement in like racial instigation here in America. Yes. Do you think uh, they're involved with these? The illegal immigration, the protests are going on right now. Absolutely, it's the whole Aslan movement that the Jesuits are backing for the purpose of taking back the Southwest, making it re reuniting it with Mexico, and it is very much Masonic, 
and very much backed by the Roman hierarchy. Just like all the racial agitation between the blacks and the whites and so on, all done by the Jesuits to divide the peoples for the purpose of having internal insurrection and revolution that further justifies martial law. Yeah, I was looking at the, on the Aslan uh, website, and half of it's like anti-Israel and pro-PLO and all this See, that's, that that's a sign that's Jesuit controlled. They're also anti-white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Look for that, too. Have you have you ever heard of a book called uh, Malcolm X's Last Speeches, edited yes. by a guy named Bruce Perry? I have, I have heard of the book, but I've never read it. I, I've read through it, and it, Malcolm X talks about how the Ku Klux Klan, how uh, Elijah Muhammad once brought in James yeah. Venable, Ku Klux Klan lawyer, yeah. to represent the, the, the yeah. nation of Islam in yeah. rural Louisiana. Yeah, Name Malcolm X, who I who is the one I have the utmost respect for, I devote two pages in my book. He was the one who said the nation of Islam and the Ku Klux Klan have the same paymasters. It, it also said that the the Ku Klux Klan was going to give the nation of Islam land in the Carolinas or Georgia to Georgia. start their own, own They've country. already done it. They've given them farms, that's right. They work together. Very so, interesting. It, I've, been, you can, I've been a fan of for years for a while. I've been waiting to talk to you for a long time, but thank you. My pleasure. All right. Eric, I'll tell you something. Um, I've kept you longer than you uh, you were planning, but let me mention something. I have a, a the, my last guest, and uh, I just wanted to mention this to you. I thought you might be interested. Uh, I'm going to do a segment with uh, a person who's con uh, called a Duplessis orphan, and this is a story that goes back to CIA uh, uh, mind control programs, use of illegal drugs on children, and there's thousands of these children now surfacing, and uh, it's interesting that they come from Catholic orphanages uh, who basically were working together with the government, changing uh, these innocent children. And my, my guest is Pierre Sampson today, who at six years old was in a Catholic orphanage, and overnight he was considered insane and used uh, in mind control and drug experiments. Uh, just another side shoot of how uh, perhaps this infiltration of the church has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, it, this was back in the 50s when this started. But anyway, you want me to just comment on that. Or? Yeah, I just wanted you to to comment. Well, on that. my uh, my understanding of that is that um, the Jesuits, of course, had put together the SS, and the SS was the like the Jesuit order within the Third Reich, policing the party and policing the armies and and uh, most everything else. But at the end of the war, then the Vatican enabled the high officers of the SS, including Heinrich Himmler to escape and got them out through the Vatican rat lines and brought them into the U.S. and then a couple of years later in 1947 created the Central Intelligence Agency which was a continuation of the SS. Out of the CIA you have MK Ultra and these horrible experiments. Okay, Eric. Well, thanks a lot for being with us. We'll have you on again and uh, I need to take a break. That was Thank Eric you, Phelps. Great. That was Eric Phelps, author of Vatican's Assassins.